This model is an introduction to the course Evaluation of Public Policies. There is increasing recognition among governments and donors that rigorous evaluation of policies and intervention should guide the decision-making process. Impact evaluations that are carefully designed and properly implemented can provide unique information critical to the formulation of efficient policies. The primary objective of this course is to provide practical guidance for designing and implementing rigorous impact evaluations. At the end, you will be able to identify the best methods to evaluate a program, a treatment or a policy, and you will have a broad understanding of the conditions and tools required to obtain valid impact estimates. This model is an introduction to the impact evaluation in general, but also to the contents that will be presented in this course. I will start with an example aiming to answer the question, why do we need impact evaluation? I will then introduce three concepts that are fundamental for impact evaluation. The idea of an observed contrafactual, that is the question, what will have happened without an intervention? Second, the concept of endogenous selection into a treatment and its major consequence, the selection bias. The third concept is causality. The fundamental challenge of all impact evaluations is to measure causal relationships between a treatment and some outcomes. Without going into the details, I will list all the impact evaluation methods that will be discussed throughout the course. At the end of the model, I will conclude. I would like to motivate the need for impact evaluation using an example from the education sector. Public education is a central policy subject all around the world. Even in the United States, the quality of public education is a major challenge for policymakers. In the US, social scientists are constantly asked to collaborate with government officials to design programs or treatments to improve the quality of education. Economists are often consulted because we have well-developed theories about what drives the quality of education. These theories can be formally written down using mathematical models, which in turn can be estimated with the help of some theoretical assumptions and secondary data. Secondary data refers to all kind of information collected by someone other than the user. Common sources of secondary data for impact evaluation are censuses, surveys, administrative data, organizational records, and tax records. From the estimation of these theoretical models, scientists can come up with some prediction or estimation of what will be the impact of a policy in a population of interest. In the mid-60s, the public education policies in the U.S were highly influenced by this scientific approach. The relevance of the academic opinion during this period is reflected in a landmark policy document known as the Coleman Report. The Coleman Report is one of the first social studies commissioned by the U.S. Congress itself to inform government officials of what should be done regarding public education. The results of this study shaped the U.S. education policy for many years. At that time in the 60s, there was a consensus on some actions that should be taken to improve the quality of education. These recommendations come from a mixture of theoretical models, behavioral assumptions, and secondary data. To improve the quality of education, teachers should be more educated. More teachers should have graduate education. Student-teacher ratio should be lower and public spending on education should increase. This means social scientists advise to have better educated teachers, smaller classes, and more money invested in education. The data suggests that the government did globally follow these recommendations in the US. This image shows the percentage of teachers with a master's degree or higher over time. In 1961, about 23.5% of teachers had a graduate diploma. By 2006, this statistic was almost 62%. The level of education of teachers in public schools clearly increased. Student-teacher ratio also dropped over that same period. 
in the 1970s, the average number of students per teacher was around 22. By 2005, that number was around 15 students and a half per teacher. This trend follows the policy recommendation of reducing class size. The total expenditure per pupil also increased over time. Public spending per student was about 5,200 in 1970, and it constantly increased going over 12,000 by 2005. These numbers reflect values in 2009 dollars. They are corrected for inflation. They suggest that more money was invested in education as recommended by social scientists. All these trends can be viewed as treatments, changes in the education policy over that time period. A natural question arises, did they work? Did education improve in the US thanks to these treatments? An important education outcome in the US is dropout rate. The US has a relatively large number of students who do not finish high school and leave the education system as soon as they attain the legal age to do so. I will use a related variable to measure the impact of the recommendations on education. The image shows the percentage of high school graduates in the US over our treatment period. It is fair to say that the percentage of high school graduates did not improve over that time period. If anything, the number of high school graduates has decreased. Around 77% of students graduated from public high schools in 1970s. That same statistic is not even 75% in 2005. Test scores are another outcome used to measure education quality. Here too, the trends seem quite flat. Standardized test scores in reading and math did not improve much between 1971 and 2008. This is true for students of different ages, 9-year-old, 13-year-old, 17-year-old, it seems to be a general trend. There are two ways to interpret this empirical evidence. There is a pessimistic way and an optimistic way. The pessimistic approach is to highlight the fact that there has been no improvement in the percentage of high school graduates and no improvement in the standardized test scores, even though the policy recommendations were implemented. This lack of improvement could be the result of ineffective policies. Maybe the recommendations were useless and the treatments did not work. The optimistic approach, on the other hand, is to say it was a great choice to follow the policy recommendations in education. Imagine the steep downward slope that we would have observed had the US not invested so much on education. Thanks to the treatment, the education outcomes have been stabilized rather than deteriorated. That is a more positive reading of the data. The fact is that we don't know which one of these two interpretations is correct. We don't know what is called the counterfactual. We don't know what will have happened to the high school graduation rates or the standardized test scores had the US not increased teacher education reduce class size and increase education expenditures over those 30 years. This problem of unobserved contrafactual is the fundamental motivation for this course. There is a need to provide rigorous evaluation of programs and policies. Impact evaluation has become almost a duty, a requirement for governments and institutions, and a right of taxpayers and donors. Everyone should be informed about the causal impact of expanding programs and the causal effects of expensive policies. This course is about the most common tools that help you measure a treatment impact. Throughout the models, we will discuss what kind of data do you need and what kind of theoretical requirements you should meet to correctly estimate the impact of a treatment. Around the world, governments and organizations spend billions of dollars every year to improve outcomes such as income, learning, or health. Whether or not these programs and interventions actually achieve their goals is a crucial policy question. The growing interest in impact evaluation responds to an increasing demand for evidence-based policies. Impact evaluation is also a transparency tool. 
beyond program design and policy guidance, impact evaluation is increasingly being used to enhance accountability. It can guide budget allocation and can help setting intervention targets in a transparent manner. When implementing an impact evaluation, our primary objective is to measure a causal relationship. We seek to answer the question, what is the impact or what is the causal effect of a program on an outcome of interest? The causal effect is the hallmark of impact evaluation, that is, which changes in the outcome can be directly attributed to an intervention or treatment. The approach chosen to identify causality will determine the econometric method required for an impact evaluation. In this course, we will study a variety of methods that you can use to approximate the counterfactual of the treatment. That is, to answer the question, what will have happened to the treated units had they not received the intervention? All methods studied in this course will start by funding or constructing a comparison group, a credible counterfactual, then finding differences with respect to the treatment group who benefit from the intervention. At first hand, it's not possible to argue that one impact evaluation method is better than the other. All evaluation methods studied in this course have the potential to produce valid counterfactuals to evaluate a program. They are all good impact evaluation methods. The challenge of the researcher consists in choosing the best evaluation method given the context and the specific characteristics of a program. The validity of each method relies on the validity of its underlying requirements. Even the most powerful method can lead to the wrong conclusions if the assumptions supporting the method are not verified in practice. There are two key elements for conducting rigorous impact evaluation. First, get to know the program or intervention that you are evaluating. Researchers working in their home countries or communities have a comparative advantage because they know many details about the program and interventions that are not necessarily documented. Local researchers may have privileged access to information that can be used to improve and impact evaluation. Second, clearly state the assumptions underlying your evaluation method. Impact evaluation methods can be separated into two types, experimental and quasi-experimental. Experimental methods are based on a random selection procedure, for example, a lottery, to decide who benefits from a program and who does not. Experimental evaluations are also known as randomized controlled trials, or RCTs. Random allocation to treatment and control groups is the best method for evaluating the impact of a program in terms of its statistical properties. RCT is used as the benchmark to judge all other evaluation methods. The second type, the quasi-experimental methods, refer to evaluation techniques that do not involve random assignment to the treatment. Quasi-experimental methods are used when program beneficiaries are not chosen using random selection procedures. The main challenge when using non-experimental methods is that the treatment group is subject to what is called a selection bias. There is a selection bias when some members of the population of interest are less likely to benefit from a treatment than others. This means that treated units are systematically different from the rest of the population of interest and thus are not directly comparable to the non-treated units. The two groups, treated and untreated, may differ in a variety of ways. They might have different observed characteristics, but more importantly, they might systematically differ in unobserved characteristics, which cannot be controlled for in the statistical analysis. In the absence of random assignment, when we find differences in the outcomes between treated and untreated units, we are unable to tell if their performance is different thanks to the treatment they receive or simply because they were different to begin with. This identification problem is formally called endogeneity. In general, selection into the treatment in programs is endogenous and creates a selection bias in the treatment group.
The best way to separate or to identify a treatment effect from a selection bias is to conduct an RCT. The process of random assignment to treatment and control group ensures the equivalence in both observed and unobserved characteristics, thereby ruling out the selection bias. Quasi-experimental methods provide alternative tools to get rid of the selection bias in a more technical way, using econometric tools or special data. The instrumental variables method relies on some external source of variation that determines treatment participation. This variation helps us distinguish the treatment effect from the selection bias. The instrumental variable method requires what we call instruments or observable external factors outside the individual's control that influence their likelihood of participating in a program. Another non-experimental evaluation method is the difference-in-difference method, also known as diff-in-diff diff, or double differences. This approach compares the changes in outcomes over time between treated and untreated units. The power of this method is that it eliminates any selection bias that is constant over time. The diff and diff cancels out any selection bias caused by observed or unobserved characteristics intrinsic to the individual or the environment, but that do not change before and after the treatment. Matching is another non-experimental approach that uses large data sets and statistical techniques to construct an artificial comparison group that is not subject to selection bias. Among the matching methods, the propensity score matching is probably the most popular. It constructs an artificial comparison group with similar probabilities of receiving the program. There is also the regression discontinuity method. This is an econometric technique that is 50 years old or so, but came back to a second life about 15 years ago. This method is used when there is a clear observable participation determinant that selects who obtains the treatment and who does not. Regression discontinuity is used when program participation is determined by a cutoff threshold. This observed eligibility criteria divides the population of interest into two groups, treated and untreated and reduces the selection bias around the threshold. The idea is to compare agents on both sides of the cutoff. In general, any endogenous event or factor that disrupts the endogenous selection into a program can be used to disentangle the treatment effect from the selection bias. We call natural experiments the evaluation studies in which agents are exposed to some unpredicted and and controlled event that determines participation into a program. Natural experiments are not an impact evaluation method per se, but rather an identification source that allows us to get rid of the selection bias and measure the treatment effect, the causal effect of the shock or the event on an outcome. Another way to identify selection from causation is to artificially disrupt the endogenous selection process similar to what we do in RCTs. Experimental economics uses this same principle at small scale under more controlled environment and call these interventions laboratory experiments or field experiments. Experiments are deliberate intrusions or exogenous treatments of an ongoing process to study the effect of those intrusions on individual and group behavior. They are part of a broader field called behavioral economics. Controlled experiments can be especially useful in impact evaluation to understand the behavioral mechanism behind a treatment. Laboratory and field experiments can provide an insight of why a program works. In practice, researchers mix all these methods and tools to evaluate programs. Once you have these techniques, you need to find the best way to combine them and use them in an effective way to determine if a program works, for whom does it work, and why does it work. When implementing impact evaluations, ethical issues must be carefully considered. Some of the ethical considerations relate to the rules used to select program beneficiaries and to the methods by which human subjects are studied. 
There is also a responsibility for transparency in documenting research plans, data and results. We will discuss these ethical issues throughout the models. The most basic ethical principle in impact evaluation is that the delivery of interventions with known benefits should not be denied or delayed only for the purpose of an evaluation. Evaluations should not dictate how benefits are assigned. Instead, evaluations should be fitted to program conditions and natural constraints such as budget restriction or treatment capacity. The question of impact evaluation is a quest for causality. A rigorous evaluation allows us to identify causal connections between a treatment or intervention and an outcome. The theory of change forms the backbone of any measurement impact. It depicts the sequence of events and describes the causal logic of how and why a treatment will reach its intended outcomes. The context and assumptions behind the causal path in the theory of change should be clearly specified. We want to know if a program works or not, but having an idea of why it works is crucial for replication and scaling, and it will help us choose the outcomes that we need to measure and highlight the impact of the program. Before implementing an evaluation, researchers should construct what is called a chain of results, a description that outlines how the project is supposed to achieve the intended results. The graphical representation of the chain of results will help you disentangle the intervention inputs, activities, the outputs and the outcomes that stem from the expected changes among beneficiaries. The inputs are the resources at disposal of the intervention, including staff and budget. The activities are the actions taken or work performed to convert inputs into outputs. The outputs are the tangible goods and services that the intervention produces. These are directly under the control of the implementing agency. Sometimes output themselves are present as evaluation results. However, outputs, such as the number of beneficiaries reached, delivery service, and other tangible results are outputs, one step in the result chain. Outputs are very important, but they are not the objective of an impact evaluation. Impact evaluation goes beyond the chain of results. Remember that we are interested in the counterfactual. The outcomes in the chain of results are likely to be achieved once the agents have benefit from the program. These are usually achieved in the medium and long term and are usually not directly under the control of the implementing agency. The construction of a theory of change is an opportunity to strengthen the links between researchers evaluating the program, program administrators, policy makers and stakeholders. All actors should collaborate to develop a common vision of the intervention, its goal, and the paths to achieve those goals. The evaluation of the program Piso Firme in Mexico can give you an idea of how a well-developed theory of change looks like. Before discussing the article itself, I would like to open a parenthesis to talk about the readings in this course. I will ask you to read several documents. The two main types of readings in this course are methodological books, chapters, and then articles from scientific journals. These articles have been through a rigorous process of peer review, which acts as a selection device and filter to certify the quality of this research. Some of the articles are milestone studies that have influenced posterior research, while others are more recent research examples that illustrate the use of a method. A good way to approach scientific articles in impact evaluation is to read them through the UTOS formulation. The EUROS is an evaluation system proposed by Lee Kronbach back in 1982. According to this approach, any evaluation should clearly differentiate the unit of analysis, the treatment, the outcomes being measured, and the setting or the context of the impact evaluation. These elements can then be used to derive valid causal inference. When you read an article, a paper we say, try to identify those elements. Make sure you know what is the unit of analysis. It might be individuals, schools, villages, provinces, anything. Summarize the treatment or intervention being studied in a few sentences. Write down what's the intervention of policy change. 
clarify the outcomes being measured in this study. And finally, try to understand the setting, the context in which the treatment takes place. This last step is very important and is often neglected. Programs and interventions might have different impact in Mexico than in Vietnam. In addition to this element, you might want to write down for each article the method or the combination of methods used to identify the treatment effect. Use the EUROS model to read the evaluation of the PISO FIRME program. PISO FIRME means firm floor. This program replaces dirt floors with cement floors in low-income households in Mexico. The general objective of the program is to improve living standards. The administrators of PISO FIRME expected the program to improve health and nutrition of participants. In the long run, researchers also anticipated improvement in child cognitive development and adults' welfare. In this Mexican program, the inputs are clear. Eligible households are offered up to 50 square meters of cement. The program covers the cost of the cement through equal contributions of municipal and state resources. Households supply the labor input needed to prepare and lay the floor. Among the activities on the delivery date, beneficiaries prepare the rooms following a set of technical specifications and instructions provided by program volunteers. The cement is delivered by large trucks that roll through the neighborhoods, spreading the cement house by house. After the cement is poured, each family smooths out the floor according to the instructions they received. The entire process is completed in one day. In Piso Firme, the output is the construction of new cement floors. The outcomes of Piso Firme are improved home environments, happiness, and cleanliness. In the long run, the outcomes are child health and cognitive development, adult mental health, and well being. The rationale for this result chain is that dirt floors are vectors of parasites because they are harder to keep clean. Parasites can be ingested by humans when they are tracked into the home by animals or people. The existing literature in health shows that young children who live in households with dirt floors are more likely to be infected with intestinal parasites which can cause diarrhea and malnutrition, often leading to impaired cognitive development. Cement floors interrupt the transmission of parasitic infestations. They also control temperature better and are more aesthetically pleasant. A rigorous evaluation needs to be paired by the specification of which outcome measures will be used to assess results. In PISO FIRME, the outcomes are measured as incidence of diarrhea, malnutrition, micronutrients deficiency, cognitive development indices, housing satisfaction indices, depression rates, and perceived stress indexes. When choosing indicators, it's a good idea to identify indicators along the results chain and not just at the level of outcome so that you will be able to track the causal logic of your program. A classic impact evaluation response to the question of whether or not or to what extent a program changed the final outcome. More recent impact evaluations tend to introduce creative ways to evaluate the chain of results itself, the mechanism behind the program results. This is the motivation for this course to have laboratory experiments and behavioral economics at the end. You may find some new ideas that could make your own impact evaluation innovative and more interesting. Not all programs warrant an impact evaluation. Impact evaluation should be used selectively when the question being posed calls for a strong examination of causality. Evaluations are costly and should be used strategically. To justify mobilizing technical and financial resources to carry out an impact evaluation, the intervention to be evaluated should be innovative, it is worth testing new promising treatments, replicable, evaluate programs that can be scaled up or can be applied in different settings, Strategically relevant and influential, the evidence provided by an impact evaluation should be relevant to policymakers for program expansion, reform, or budget allocation decisions. Untested, it's better to test programs that have not been evaluated before. You can use these elements to motivate the importance of your own impact evaluation. 
What can we conclude from this short introduction to our course? First and foremost, impact evaluation is all about selecting or constructing a good contrafactual to separately identify a treatment effect from a potential selection bias. All impact evaluation should respond to the question, what will have happened in the absence of treatment? Impact evaluations can provide unique information on the efficiency and value of all kinds of programs and policies. Judicious impact evaluations can help the formulation of sound social policies and expand the state of knowledge about what works, who does it affect, and why. Experimental methods are the best methods for obtaining accurate estimates of impact. If you can't do a randomized experiment, by all means, do a randomized experiment. If random assignment is not possible or suitable, there are other ways to draw causal inference. Quasi-experimental methods offer an alternative impact evaluation approach. Impact evaluation should be undertaken strategically, thinking about the theory of change behind the intervention. Finally, not all programs warrant an impact evaluation.